Hello and welcome back to the channel. So today we were going to be looking at this, the Oregon Scientific Pen PDA. Spoiler alert, this didn't actually go to plan. However, this is a good opportunity to discuss a mainstay of retro tech, which is this, the resistive touch screen. And of course, one of the methods you can look at attempting to repair it. Before we get started, I need to give a big shout out to Keith and Jane Foster for donating these Walkmans, especially this Sony WM22. It doesn't currently work, but I think we can get that thick. A massive shout out to Rich's Random Retro Reviews, Von Rummelsdorf, and of course, Kirti Unlisted for your super thanks. Your continued support of the channel is greatly appreciated. And of course, a massive thanks goes out to Superwife, who bought me this for Christmas. So let's get into this. So this video started, like all the best videos do, with an unboxing. However, unlike most videos, because the battery tags were still on the PDA, I hadn't taken it out and had a play with it. Also, weirdly, there's very little information about these online at all, including difficulties finding the dates it was available. There are a couple of reviews and they all say the same thing. It was good as a budget model and the contrast on the screen is terrible. So my intention was to unbox it, play with the device for a week or so, and then get back to you with a full rundown. However, on completing the unboxing, it was clear that while the LCD was working absolutely fine, there was no feedback from the resistive screen at all. And having no physical buttons, that makes it impossible to do anything with this. Indeed, I couldn't even turn it off. So before we go on to look at potential fixes, it's worth knowing a little bit about how resistive touchscreens actually work. This technology has been around a very long time and it's still in use today in point of sale machines, medical devices, and some industrial machines, among others. They are surprisingly simple and the vast majority of them only actually have four wires to connect up. Simply take two clear pieces of plastic add a conductive coating with a suitable resistance, let's say 100 ohms. Next up, and most importantly, we need to add some spaces to prevent the two sides touching accidentally. And jobs are good. Un. Now, if we connect a wire along the bottom edge of both layers, and put the two panels facing each other, pressing down on the top layer will now allow the current to pass between the two wires. Measuring the resistance will give you the position on the Y axis. The resistance increasing if we go higher or further away from the wires and decreasing as we come towards them. Do the same for one of the sides and we now have an X position. And the point where those two cross is the position of the stylus. Moving the stylus causes the resistance to change and the computer can track the location. So this is a very simple and very effective way of being able to monitor the pressure point at which the pen is on the screen. Of course, there's no very variation in pressure, it's either on or off. And the other thing that is worth noting is that if you have two touch points, which we're used to on our smartphones, then it adds the sum of the two. And so you end up with a, a line that runs in between the two points, like so. Most computers with a touch screen will have a calibrate screen, and this is to allow for variation and errors. Usually it revolves around pointing and touching at three or four touch points like so, or like this, or like this, or this one, or like this. There are two likely causes of this touchscreen being dead. Number one, and most likely, is that the two layers over time have become stuck together. Given its age and the fact it's not been out of the box, this is very likely. The second option is that there's an issue with one of the ribbon cables and the contacts have been severed. This is quite a common issue on clamshell devices such as the Series 5 or the Janata 720. But given that this has literally no moving parts, that's a very unlikely cause on here. So all we need to do is try and separate the two layers. And the simplest way of doing this is to apply a little bit of heat. The heat, of course, will cause the air between the two layers to expand, pushing the two layers apart, hopefully allowing the separators to return to doing their job. You do need to be a little bit careful. We don't want to melt the plastic on the top layer, 
damage the LCD or distort the plastics of the shell itself. So for this reason, I'd recommend against a heat gun, but a hairdryer should be relatively safe. So let's grab Superwife's hairdryer and give this a go. Okay, so what's happened is, so I've got an area here that's working, oh, and an area here that's working, that's working, and there's a bit working here. So this suggests to me that somewhere it is stuck down on one of these edges, and there is a little bit of a fault just here, which makes me think it could be there. However, it is better than it was. I'm getting a lot more responsiveness. So it might be worth letting it cool and trying again. Okay, so I've got some limited functionality. I can open the various applications. I can calculate things as long as they only involve four and six. And I can now power the machine on and off using the touchscreen. However, it's still pretty much useless as I can't enter any kind of text or do anything of any more interest. So why don't we take it apart and have a little look. So once you've removed the battery cover, you can see two screws. There are four all together and undoing these with a little bit of wriggling will allow you to separate the case. Once inside, you'll see four screws for the PCB. Separating those, being careful not damage the wire that connects the speaker, you can then separate the screen from the front panel. After that, there's a couple of screws that hold this grey plastic in place and that allows you to separate the digitizer from the screen. So this screen is quite unusual for two reasons. First of all, uh, it doesn't use four wires. Instead, there is a wire connected, well, four on this side and four on this side to give us our array. And then along the bottom to meet up with each wire, giving us the grid pattern. You can just about make out the separate squares. I don't know if I can catch that on the camera or not. The other thing that's unusual is this gray plastic spacer actually creates an air gap between the LCD and the touch sensitive panel. That means that this isn't resting on anything when you press it in and normally it would sit against the glass to give it some resistance when you pop your pen down. The main alternative to resistive touchscreens is of course the capacitive screen that you have on your phone. These work very differently. Instead of detecting actual touch, they generate an electrostatic field and look for distortions within the field. And it's for that reason that they work with a finger, but not with a pen or a plastic object. It also means they go a bit crazy if they get wet. Resistive screens, on the other hand, are cheap. They offer better accuracy, lower power consumption, and they still work when wet. But there are some significant disadvantages to them. Number one, because you have to actually distort the screen in order to register a touch point, that means you're always applying pressure to that top layer. And with repeated use, it will become scratched, hazy, or even wear out completely. In addition, Every layer that you put on top of a screen reduces the contrast slightly. So we have the issue here that we've taken an LCD and we've added two extra layers. Each layer reduces light transmission by reflectance by about 5%. So immediately, 10% of the light going onto the LCD is lost. Add to that the fact that the polarization will then absorb 50% of the light going through, and we now only have 45% of the original light. On the way back out, we'll lose another 10% to those two resistive layers. In simple terms, if we started with 1,000 lumens, we only get out about 405. So without the touchscreen, the maximum contrast of an LCD is about 50%, which is reasonable, but that is why they look slightly grey, or sometimes green rather than white like paper or like an e-ink display. Add in the touch screen and the contrast drops to a maximum of 40% and it's quite noticeable as you can see here. The massive advantage to a capacitive screen is of course that you can put the sensor behind the screen itself so you don't lose any of the contrast or light transmitted through that screen and you don't actually have to physically touch the screen for it to register where you're pointing. This gives brighter displays and reduces wear on that top layer, although the top layer on this can be glass rather than a squidgy plastic. 
For the screen on this, the last option I have is to actually soak the screen in isopropyl alcohol and split the two layers. Now, I've never had success doing this before, so I don't anticipate I will this time. Of course, if you have a better idea or you've got some tips or tricks, pop a comment below and I'll happily investigate those before I try and split the screen in half. So I'll give it a couple of weeks before I actually do it and then I'll update you in the description below as to whether it worked or not. I'm hoping you guys have some better ideas for me. So this wasn't the video I intended to make, but if you've enjoyed it anyway, don't forget to hit like and subscribe. And if you have any thoughts, comments or opinions on the touchscreens that we've talked about, pop them below. Huge thanks to all the viewers, commenters, subscribers, and of course, a massive shout out to all the members who directly support the channel and help drive its direction. As always, my name's Hugh. This is Handheld Computing. Thanks for watching.